I don't think so. Broadcasting live on the UnitedWest.org AM radio network and simulcasting on DirecTV, iHeartRadio, Roku, and the World Wide Web, this is Enemies of the State with Tom Trento. All right, it's the end of the week, Friday, the 15th of May. 2015. I can't believe it's May already, and it's uh, halfway through the month. Just a few more weeks, and all the little kitties will be running around uh, all summer. You parents out there, I'm sure you're happy about that. Uh, yes. But drive. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You have kids, Damon? Yes, we do. Yeah, we, kinda. Yes, we, kind of. <laughs> uh, do you know their names by any chance? Yes, no. I know. I do. Oh, okay. Good. Some uh, of them. Well, well, be careful, everybody, in the summertime. Kids are all over the place. They're the next generation. And um, ironically, we're going to talk about some kids today, some, uh, some young kids that uh, made significant decisions to do some extraordinary stuff. And we have an amazing show for you. We're going to talk about uh, kids who are warriors and uh, who were killed in action. And we have a couple of their dads with us, gold star dads. We're going to take a look at that situation. And uh, our big idea is very simple today. We're going to look at uh, the commander-in-chief and raise the question, is President Obama the worst commander-in-chief in the history of the, no, not the history of the United States, in the history of the galaxy ever? Is he the worst person ever to put in charge of the only superpower military on the face of the earth. Yes, Will yes. he, as we predicted in 2008, absolutely devastate, decimate the United States military if indeed he came into office? We're going to look at all of those issues, but we're going to look at the personal component of fathers who have lost their warrior sons. And then a little later in the show, we're going to look at uh, the uh, whether or not, and I'm speaking to my homies here as a Christian, whether or not we can get Christians to get off their asses, their, you know, ch they, their church pew butts, and get up on November 8th, 2016, and actually vote, and vote intelligently for people that understand the threats facing us, the threat of Islamic Jihad, the threat of the Marxist left in this country. Whether or not we can get Christians who should vote in a conservative manner, whether we can get them up here in Florida, at least one million people that say they believe in God and the Bible and all of that did not vote. And President Obama in 2012 won by 73,000 votes. It's a sin. It's a sin. We're going to talk with our special in-studio. Let's bring our special in-studio guest right in right now, our uh, dear friend Billy Vaughn. Billy, what's going on, man? Good nice to see you. Nice to be here, Tom. Good, good to see good you. To be here. Good to see you. Good to see you. Everybody should know that Tom is and has been one of Karen and I's best friends uh, since right after we lost Aaron. But don't suck up to him, Billy. It's just, God, he's just going to get a big <laughs> head, and it's just going to be it's gonna no, be it's all a strange bad story. for the rest of the day. And it's just, it's, no, a, it's a strange story. We'll tell it here. It's, it's too serious to suck up about. Yeah, it is. It's a serious story. It's a, and it's a strange story, what happened with uh, how we got involved um, and... Um, uh, yeah, it's a, a it's a very moving story. As are any of these, where these these young guys uh, went off to war to fight and came home, but not the way we would have liked them to come home. Our other guest, let's bring him in too. We have uh, Greg Buckley, Sr., skyping in today. Greg, hi. How are you, Greg? How are you, sir? Good, good, good. Uh, there you are. Nice to see you. Um, we hey, I've Greg, seen Billy here. Good to see you, Greg. Hey, Billy. You guys know each other. Uh, Greg, you and I have never met, uh, but I have watched um, a lot of your um, grief, a lot of your anger on the, uh, the cable networks, the, the news networks, a uh, couple of years, almost three years now, what, August 10th, 2012? Uh, yes, sir. Greg Buckley, Jr. And Billy, you were uh, August 6, 2011, just about a year apart. Yeah. Um, Aaron. Aaron uh, Vaughn. Um, well, we got a lot to go over, and uh, let's start with, with you, Greg, a little bit. 
you lost your son three years ago, almost. Um, I, what I want to do for our audience, and we're on uh, WSBR radio going from North Miami uh, all the way up to uh, Palm Beach, and then we're on WHFS 1010 out in Tampa, the Tampa Bay area. But we're on the internet uh, as a TV show worldwide, all over the place, theunitedwest.org. It's May 15th, uh, Friday. And we're on teapartycommunity.com. Portions of this will most likely be on uh, Breitbart TV. So we get out all over the place. We, re we reach a lot of people. Uh, Greg, you went through uh, a very difficult time. You probably, you and your family, still going through it. Uh, Give us a quick overview, and then I, then we got a couple of questions, Billy and I, for you. It's just, um, <clears throat> Greg was a little kid, about 14 years of age. He came to me and told me that he was going to join the Marine Corps when he got older. Uh, I didn't pay any mind to it. Little kids say a lot. So when he got out of high school, he uh, went right into the Marine Corps, right after high school. <clears throat> and... Uh, just one thing after the other, he went through this boot camp, and he was never so excited about anything like this. He was just, he just felt like he was a part of a family, and he just loved the whole idea of being a Marine and, you know, standing up for the United States. So, winds up, he went through, served about almost two years, a little over two years, and uh, he came home for my birthday and told me that uh, he's leaving in three weeks to go to Afghanistan. We never discussed it. He just told me that's what he's doing. He's going to be shipped over there the first week in April. Winds up, uh, gets over there after about two months go by. He calls me up in the middle of the night, and I wake up about 2.30 in the morning, and uh, he doesn't sound like himself. And I was like, Greg, what's going on? He goes, Dad, he goes, this isn't a good place. I was like, I don't understand. He goes, uh, you know, to make a long story short, he turned around and told me over the phone that uh, he just felt that uh, he was going to be murdered over in Afghanistan. And I told him that sounds outrageous. And he said, uh, I said, you got you guys with you all the time. He said, I said, you have weapons with you. He says, no. He says, the guys that were training are going to turn on me. He says, I just feel it. And it's happened more than you can imagine. He said, it's called green on blue. So after that, I went into the office the next day and went online and I found out about Green on Blue, about how we're training these so-called Afghans and uh, they're turning around taking the weapons that we've given them and turning them on us. And we're talking over hundreds. Hundreds and hundreds of soldiers have been murdered on Green on Blue attacks. My son is told to train these people and help them, teach them how to fight and teach them how to shoot. And at the end of the day, they're going to turn around and kill him. And uh, what winded up happening was that uh, he wrote a goodbye letter back home to mom and to myself, thanking us for everything that we've done for him. You're kidding me. He actually he wrote a letter to you? Really? Yeah. It's posted up the letter. And uh, in the letter, it says, you know, dad, my, not just my dad, but my best friend. And we were. We were so tight. Me and him, we were just always together. I was his coach for football, basketball, baseball. I mean, we were together all the time. Days off, out of school, he would come to work with me. You know, we were just always together. And uh, when I read the letter, it was heart-wrenching. And he said to his mom that she's his queen and his brothers that he wanted him to grow up to be good young men and, you know, not get involved with the wrong thing and just do the right thing. So after I read the letter, I was disturbed. I tried to get in touch with him, and I couldn't. And then he called me one night again in the middle of the night, and uh, I said, Greg, what's going on? What was up with that letter? He said, I told you. He said, I wasn't lying. He says, I'm not coming home in November. They're going to kill me here. I just, me and Richie and a few other other guys have the same feeling. Richie Rivera winded up being murdered, executed with Greg the same night. So, and Richie's mom told me after it that Richie told her the same thing, that he felt that he was going to be killed by the people that he's helping. So it's just, uh, it's just a heart-wrenching story. I don't want to go all the way into it, but uh, what winds up happening is, you know, we hung up the phone and uh, I made phone calls and nobody would answer me back. I just, you know, wanted answers and I couldn't get them. And 
it was always brief when we were talking on the phone. And his birthday was July 17th. I tried to get in touch with him, and I couldn't. He called me back, and uh, he called me back five days after his birthday. He turned 21 years old on July 17th, but he was out on a tour. So he called me and told me that um, I got great news. And I was like, what's that? He goes, I'm going to be able to leave here on August 15th. I'm leaving on August 12th, but I'll be back home on August 15th. And I'm so excited because I feel that maybe I have a chance of getting out of here alive, being that I'm not going to have to go home in November. So he was very excited about that. So we spoke again, and then uh, he said to me, I don't want to speak to you anymore. He says, I just want to come home and be with you and mom and my brothers, and maybe we can go to South Beach, celebrate my 21st birthday, and have a beer, a legal beer. <laughs> and... Uh, he said, and I don't have to use fake ID. <laughs> you know, we laughed about it. And um, turned around, he said, I love you. And I said, I love you too. And he said, uh, I'll see you in a, you know, a couple of days. And we hung up. And then on August 10th, from what I understand, he did his basic training, helping out everybody over there in Afghanistan and helping these so-called people over there. And uh, finished his job and went back inside his base, went to the chow house, ate, then walked into uh, the gym at about 8 o'clock, 8.15 at night with his headphones on, his T-shirt, pair of shorts. And he was so excited about coming home, he didn't even think about bringing a, you know, a weapon with him into the gym because usually they don't even bring them. Some of the guys do. But Greg didn't even want to think about that. He just wanted to go home. Everybody kept on telling me. He was just talking about going home, going home, and being with his dad and his brother and his mom. And he went into the gym. Within five minutes later, him and Richie were working out on the bench, lifting. And um, they heard a noise. Greg jumped up. And when he jumped up and turned around, a Nodden was standing right in front of my son with an AK-47 that we, the American people, supply. And I uh, proceeded to open fire and shot my son four times in his chest and once in his neck. And then right after that, Richie Rivera was shot right behind Greg. You know, these are two best friends that went to Afghanistan together. And, uh, you know, they were both executed at the same time. Richie Rivera was only 19 years old. But the heart-wrenching part about the whole thing is that my son called his own death. You know, he was 20 years old. How does a boy 20 years old know that he's going to be murdered over there? And he went and talked to his superiors, and his superiors said, Greg, to be honest with you, there's nothing we could do about this. And he turned around, Greg told one of them one day that Sawar Jan, the chief of the police in Afghanistan, was a bad person. He has ties with terrorist groups. Why is he the chief of the police in Afghanistan? And why is he in our base? And they said, we have no say about that. You know, you just do your job and watch your back. That's it, period. So it winds, winds up on August 10th. They, um, I was out at a mall having dinner and my boys called me on the phone about 10 o'clock at night, hysterical. And they kept on saying, something's wrong, something's wrong. There's four Marines at the door, or three Marines, I'm sorry, at the door. And, a, and there's a black truck right in front of the house. I got home. I don't think I have, I don't even remember driving. That's how fast I got home. And when I got home, they were down the block in a black van. And they came towards me. I came towards them. And they said to get in the van, I want to talk to you. And I said, no, I don't want to talk to you guys. You know, come in my house. They came inside the house. And... They proceeded to tell me that Lance Corporal Greg Buckley was fatally injured, and uh, you know he passed away. So, you know, at first, you know, my son's a practical joker, so I thought maybe I don't know, maybe he had his guys, you know, in the Marines set this up, you know, and I told him if they were lying, that they weren't going to make it out of the house. And because uh, the kid was my whole life. So it winds up 
It was true. And uh, it was probably the most devastating thing in my life to ever happen to me. And uh, I heard they told me that he was shot and uh, got shot. And uh, that was it. It was later on I found out through other people that he was shot five times. And then about a month later, we received a phone call from Peter King, a congressman. And he told us that we need to get in touch with Jason Breslin. Jason is a Marine that's also a firefighter in New York City. He contacted my sister Mary Liz Grissetto and proceeded to tell her that they were warned 17 days prior to August 10th that this was gonna happen. Because they turned around and got in touch with Jason, the Marine Corps, the upper brass, and asked what did they know about Sawar Jan. And he proceeded to tell them that I threw him off the base last year because we found out he has ties to terrorist groups in Afghanistan and that he's a real bad person. He sells our uniforms to them. He sold our guns to them. He's into drug laundering, prostitution of young boys. And um, that's why they threw him off the base. Well, hang on, why? Greg, hang on right there. Uh, this is Tom Trento at uh, 22 minutes after 4 o'clock on Friday, May 15th. Uh, you're listening to uh, our show today, Gold Star Dads, and Greg Buckley Sr. told us the uh, extremely tragic, sad, and um, uh, situation that should not have happened. One of these kinds of situations should not have happened. Uh, he's telling us about his son, Greg Buckley Jr., Lance Corporal Buckley, who died on August 10th, 2012 in uh, Afghanistan. Green on blue. Green is the Afghan color. Blue, the U.S. color. Um, and Greg, if uh, if I'm not mistaken, some of the reports on your son's situation that he actually had a run-in with uh, with his jihadi earlier, uh, almost a, a fist fight of of sorts, and um, and they knew he knew not just kind of uh, with a sixth sense but that this guy was actually had a bad presence on the base. Were those reports true? The report that he had a problem with one of them was a superior. Um, he was walking into the base and Greg turned around and said, I have to check you. And uh, he turned around, proceeded to yell at Greg and uh, they went back and forth and he kept on screaming in Greg's face that, you know, you guys aren't welcome here. We don't want you here. We don't want you here. And Greg turned around and said to him, you know, we're here giving ourselves our lives to you, training you, trying to help you, and you don't appreciate anything. And then they started going back and forth, and he got in Greg's face saying that he was going to kill him. And uh, then they came over, broke it up, and uh, they told Greg to apologize to him, even though Greg didn't do anything wrong. And Greg said, I had to apologize, Dad, so I apologized to him, and I went to shake his hand, and he stuck his finger out. And they told Greg to shake his finger, <clears throat> And Greg says, why would I shake his finger? He says, well, that's what you have to do. You know, the whole thing here is what's so outrageous is that everything is set up to protect the Afghans, you know, and respect them. They don't respect any of our military at all. And this is where the problem is. And, you know, they were told 17 days earlier, like I told you, that this was going to happen. Now, Sawar Jan isn't the gentleman he had the uh, run-in with. Sawar that's someone Jan else. That's, a, that's the real bad guy on base, Sawar Jan, yes. right? Okay. Yeah. He's a bad person, and everybody knew it. So the Marine Corps got all the emails sent over to them about this gentleman. And when it was sent over to them, they read them, and nobody wants to let us know who it is that read them and made the decision to leave Sawar Jan on the base after Jason told them, you have to remove him off the base immediately, because if you don't, He's going to do something. He's that bad of a person. Was he the shooter? My son. Was he the shooter? No, who was the shooter was one of his slaves. Mm -hmm. And this is where it even gets worse. Yeah. Is one of his T boys, T -boy. T -boy. his slaves. Uh -oh. He had he had about nine T boy slaves. They're, they're young boys, they run from the ages of eleven to eighteen. And what they do is they're basically servants, T boys, and they're, you know, slaves, sex slaves to the chief of um, chief of the police and they're known to you know 
follow this practice. It's a sick practice, but this is what they do. And I never knew about it. You know, I wish I would have known more than what I know now. And I think more people need to be aware of what type of people are over there supposedly helping. And, you know, it's been a long time we've been there and nothing's changed. They're just as evil as ever. All right, hang on for, for one second. Billy, you're, uh, you're, you, you've are you been through a lot of this uh, a year earlier than Greg. Um, you've heard that story before, but you're hearing it now, you know, on the show. What's... What's going through your head? What's going through your heart? What's going through your mind? Well, obviously, you know, uh, sympathy for, for Greg and for, for their family, but also at the same time that there's story after story after story that are similar. There's story after story where when something like this happens, that the military, the brass, covers each other's hind ends. And they think that the families, they think that the warriors who have died, that they don't owe them anything about the truth coming out. And, and, and as, you know, as, he talk, as Greg talked about Greg Jr., one of the things that comes to mind, as Greg Jr. saying, you know, he, he knew it was a threat, is, is Aaron telling me, you know, Dad, we don't tell them where we're going until we get there. Because if we do, the enemy knows the, the, the Afghan commandos they're carrying out with them. Uh, a, another SEAL Team 6 member talked to Karen and I in Atlanta about a year after Aaron died and said, uh, one of these days a suicide bomber is going to get on one of these choppers with us. I just got an email from one of my buddies in Afghanistan the other night, and he said to me in the email, my greatest fear is getting shot in the back of the head by one of our Afghan allies when we go out at night. And this Navy SEAL Team 6 guy said to me, we've talked and talked to our leaders about this, but they say we're not being logical. But the men on the ground know. The men up here are following, the men higher than them are, and the women are following the agenda of the president and of this administration and of our State Department that are all making our warriors, Greg Buckley Jr. included, as Greg gave this, this instance a while ago, submit to the Afghans. Submit and then the them. Afghans laughing in our face be, be, because of what's being done. Hey, hey Greg. Um, yes. The, uh, the, the story is just an amazing story. And I, I read reports about uh, uh, your son's funeral uh, here in Oceanside. I think it was in Oceanside, yeah. New York. Uh, thousands of people out there and uh, motorcycle brigades in front of it and um how wh when was that how how soon after the the attack was the the funeral uh the funeral was the following he was uh executed and you know what i say executed because the boy had no idea that this was you know it came at him out of nowhere he was in a gym working out you know and just be shot like a like an animal like that it's just heart-wrenching and people need to know how he was murdered he wasn't murdered on a battlefield. He was executed in a gym on his own base where he should have been protected better. And ever since we spoke out, now they took the Afghans that were on Greg's base sleeping underneath Greg and on Richie and all the other guys. They had them sleeping, 30 Marines, 30 Afghans, sleeping together because they wanted them to, you know, learn our culture and us for to learn their culture. Why? Who knows? <laughs> but now they moved them off the base and now they're down, you know, Probably not too, you know, maybe two miles down the road. They built a base for them there. Now they're separated. But, you know, why did it take this to happen to separate them? It's, it's just it's, mind. It's, 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 it's uh, we got a lot to talk about. 30 minutes after the hour, 4 o'clock, 4.30 on a Friday. Beautiful Florida Friday afternoon. Tom Trento, your <coughs> enemies of the state. No enemies here today, folks. We got... Uh, Greg Buckley Sr., who's lost his son. He's a gold star dad, lost his son. Greg Buckley Jr., August 10, 2012, in a green on blue horrendous uh, execution, as, as Greg has told us. And we have Billy Vaughn here in studio, and we're all very familiar with Billy Vaughn's story with Alan, Alan, Aaron Carson Vaughn, who was um, Taken down in extortion, 17 August 6, 2011. Still a lot of confusion about that. Unknown Afghans once again on the uh, on the copter. Um, 
we're yeah, going to get into can, more can of that I, stuff. Can I um, yeah. say something now? Or you want uh, let, me, let me lay okay. one thing out for okay. both of you guys. Right. I have a very dear friend who was um, uh, tank commander, uh, Abrams tank commander, and, but he's a very intelligent guy, uh, Army uh, officer. And about two years ago, they said, we're taking you out of your tank corps. You're going to Afghanistan to the Bagram prison. He was going to the prison, and he was the, uh, the individual who was to represent 3,000 Afghani prisoners who were being transferred at that time out of the Bagram, Air, uh, Bagram prison into wherever they go to next, depending on the level of their, uh, their criminality. Um, so he had to make sure that the prisoners receive the rights they get as prisoners under, under the Geneva Convention. So you had the, the, uh, the U.S. lawyers as the plaintiffs. You had their defense attorneys, whatever. And my friend was there, kind of a mediator, to make sure all the rights of the Afghans were Afghan criminal terrorists. Mm -hmm. And he was calling me during all of this, probably shouldn't have, and telling me what was going on. He said, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my life. The, everybody in that prison is an outright jihadi terrorist. And they're laughing at this system. They're laughing at the fact that we're looking for their right. Oh, I want a new Quran. I can't, I, can't, I can't pray with this Quran. So we'd give them a new Quran. You know, my prayer cloth isn't quite right. Give them a prayer cloth. Whatever they want. All of this nonsense. And then he finds out that all of their connections, their tribal connections, they're just dealing with cousins. You know, the, the commanders of the uh, ANA, Afghan National Army, was the cousin twice removed of the guy who's now being adjudicated. And b basically, they all were released. And, he, and my friend said, this is the most egregious, atrocious injustice I've ever seen anywhere, but we just want to get rid of them. Obama just wants to get out of there. He wants nothing to do with this. He doesn't want this jail. He doesn't want to have anything to do with it. He wants to get out of there. And you know, because of a failed, flawed political policy, you get that just insane and in incoherent process on a daily basis, and then, you know, sons are lost, good American sons. Crazy situation. What were you going to say? Uh, well, one thing, one thing that Greg said about, uh, you know, you know about uh, his, his son and the other Marines being, being forced to sleep with the Afghans, uh, it's, it's the same, you know, the same area, uh, that and I'm sure you all have heard me say this before, there's actually an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, a legal document written by, signed by General John Allen. And the very title of that is the Afghanization of Special Operations Forces in Afghanistan. And the next four pages tell how our special operations warriors will adapt to the cultures and how they will become more like the Afghans to get along. And, and, and the thing, another thing that it brings to mind is Greg Buckley Jr. and the men on the base and, and Aaron and the guys doing the heavy lifting, they're not the only ones that knew about the green on blue problems. Because General John Allen said about how big a percentage was infiltrated with, with uh, the Afghan National Army, with, and it was like 25% and he, uh, uh, with, with the Taliban. And he said, this doesn't even count the ones we don't know about. The Afghan ambassador said, that as early as 2009, we know that the Taliban is at least 25% infiltrated into the ANA, the Afghan National Army. Yet, our senior military leaders, our administration, our State Department, who is running our wars, yep. and our Department of Defense, all kept on compromising our warriors and causing many to come home in body bags to families that otherwise would have never have been involved in these consequences. Uh. And, and, and it's criminal. It's, 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 it's not negligence. And, 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 and Greg, correct me on this uh, if I'm wrong. But the man that you mentioned a while ago, and I think you said his name, I think you said his name was Jason something. Right. Yes. He, he is, in fact, the only American soldier to this point that has received any kind of punishment for what happened to your son on that base. Is, is that not somewhat correct? That is correct. They gave him last year an honorable discharge from the Marine Corps because he got in contact with me and my sister Mary Liz. Yeah. Reason that 
he got in contact with us, he thought it was the right thing to do. And as soon as they found out about it, they served him papers. They came to his firehouse in New York City and ransacked his firehouse in New York City, then went to his apartment and ransacked his apartment to find more stuff on him that they can use against him. Now, they threw the man out because he stuck up for one of his fallen brothers, and that's my son, Lance Corporal Greg Buckley, as our own government should have did, but they didn't. They winded up giving A. Naden, who is a known terrorist, who was allowed into Greg's base, who was given an AK-47 by the chief of the police, Sawar Jan, who we all said was filthy, and told by Sawar Jan to go into the gym and execute as many Marines as he could. Winds up he only executed three of them and fatally injured a, a fourth, shot him six times, emptied his clip out, then dropped his uh, AK-47, ran outside and just screamed and kept on screaming that he... Yeah. Yeah, we're locked up on we the, got the uh, Skype. Skype locked up. Yeah. We'll, we'll get back to Greg. But uh, hey, Tom, I'd like yeah. to bring up. He mentioned the whole the whole sex slave thing that was uh, happening. I can't hear you, Mark. I said the whole sex slaves that that, that was occurring in right. Afghanistan. Uh, this is not a new phenomenon here. No. This this is something that's been going on for quite a while. And actually, CNN did a little two-minute report on it. It was really shocking. You know, if we can bring it while we're bringing it up. Yeah, let's do it. Back. Okay, let's roll let's it. Let's do that. Okay. Uh, it's Aaron, part of the... Aaron talk. Aaron talk. A young boy dances, dressed in women's clothing, his face lathered in makeup. He is known as Bacha Birish, or boy without a beard. Greg, turn your video on. For a crowd of Afghan men, a custom known as Bacha Bozi, or boy play. He has bells on his feet, but they might as well be chains, because Bacha Bozi is more than dancing. The boys are lured or snatched from their families and forced to become sex slaves by powerful men. CNN obtained this video from a pimp who introduced us to two dancers who are now adults. Farad and Jamil didn't want their faces shown. They say they are continuously threatened, beaten, and raped by men who attend the parties. Both say they were forced into boy play as teenagers. They continue to dance because they say it's the only thing they know and their only way to make money. For each performance, they get about $30. But the dancing often leads to assault. Farad was 13 when his older neighbor raped him and locked him up as a sex slave for five months. I got used to him. <coughs> he would sometimes take me to parties and sometimes other places. I was with him all the time. Jamil was the Bacha Birish of a powerful warlord who has since left the country. He says he is now married, but he continues to dance to provide for his younger brothers and sisters. I make them study, dress them, feed them, he says. Any money I make, I spend on my family. I don't want them to be like this, be like me. Islamic scholars have condemned Bacha Bozi as immoral, but the age-old practice goes on, especially in northern Afghanistan, and with nearly 60,000 street kids in the capital of Kabul alone, there are plenty of potential victims. One human rights group has produced a brochure warning parents about the danger. Pretty much uh, uh, unappreciated by the society, unaccepted, and illegal. But still, it, it, it can continues because of the culture of impunity, lack of uh, legal provision against this practice. Jamil and Farad feel trapped. We are not happy with this line of work, Jamil says. We say that it would be better if God could just kill us rather than this. <coughs> this. Hundreds of boys in Afghanistan don't have a choice. They are condemned to dance for their masters and one day may become masters themselves. Atia Bowie, CNN, Kabul. These are these are sick. These are sick people. You saw and, that, Greg. You saw. And these that are the nonsense. people who killed. Yeah, I've been seeing it. And yeah. those are the people who killed killed your son. The, the sex slaves that have been tortured and abused by these uh, by these individuals. Is that correct? You see, see the whole thing here is that my son did say to me. He said, "Dad, he said, a, he says there are good people in Afghanistan." He says, "But the problem here is that the people that we are training." The people that are in charge over here are disgusting people, and they can't be trusted. They're evil, and they have hate in their eyes. He says, we go through the streets, 
And there are good people there. But he said the people that we have to train, their military and their superiors are bad people. He says, and you could just see it in their eyes. When they see me out on the street and I'm not training them, they look at me like they want to kill me. He goes, it's just a sick, sick place to be. And, you know, the rules of engagement are set up to hurt us. They're not there to help us. You know, it's there to benefit the Afghans. It's not there to turn around and help us at all. And my son, you know, the guy that murdered my son, he said he was 18, 19, but the courts in Afghanistan said he was 16. And he only gave him seven years. He executed three Marines and he got seven years, meaning that he got a two and a half year sentence for each Marine that he executed. So he's going to be out, you know, by the time he's 24 years of age and I have a beautiful family and, you know, wife and kids, you know, and treat them and teach them about hatred because he's a filthy pig. And while my son, you know, is yeah, where he is. That kid will be, he he be a hero in, uh, in Afghanistan. A couple of different things. Um, it's 42 minutes after the hour. Tom Trento, your host, Enemies of the State. Uh, very fascinating discussion with Billy Vaughn, known to uh, many of our listeners and viewers. And now Greg Buckley Sr., the father of Lance Corporal Greg Buckley Jr., killed August 10, 2012, that green on blue uh, assassination execution. Um, Greg, you obviously had a very close relationship with your son, Greg. And uh, as is normal in these sort of situations, uh, you are you still dealing with the fact that you weren't able to help him? You know, I, I could have done more, I should have done more. Are you still dealing with that? And what are you doing to try to help him at this point? Well, right now we're, uh, we have a, a lawsuit going on with the Marine Corps and the government. It's not for money. It's for finding out the truth. They still haven't told me exactly how it happened, why it happened, anything. They're hiding everything from us, and I guess it has a lot to do with Jason also. They knew that they could have prevented this from happening, but because of the way the rules of engagements are set up, they, that's why my son was executed. They knew that they could have turned around and changed everything. They knew they could have turned around and removed Sawa Jan off the base, and his 15 groupies, his sex slaves, they were all wandering around the base, and Greg and his guys said constantly, why are these guys on this base? You know, there's weapons all over the place. They could just pick up one and shoot us, and they said, oh, they'll never do that. Then there's no background checks on Sawar Jan. There's no background checks on all these little terrorists that they got running around the base, a Marine base. You have 15, 16, 17-year-old boys walking around the base. Nobody knows who they are, what's their real name. There's no social security. There's no, there's no family tree to track them down. So you don't know what you have there. But what you do have is you have terrorists hanging out with my son with AK-47s all around them. But my son's supposed to be nice to these people and not talk back to them and not curse in front of them, not put his boots on the table, don't talk about his brothers, don't talk about his mom, don't talk about kids. If you have babies, you can't talk about your kids in front of these Afghans. These are all rules of engagement that you're not allowed to do in front of the Afghans because it offends them. You know what? They should be kissing our backsides. We shouldn't be kissing theirs. We're well, there to help them. That, hey, Greg, that's, that's uh, and Billy, both of you. Um, it's horrible. It's, well, obviously, what happened to both of you is tragically horrible. The, uh, the, the doctrine of winning hearts and minds whatever that means, to win hearts and minds. Do these guys even have hearts? Do they even have minds? But to win hearts and minds seems to be extremely flawed doctrine. But what could, what should we do? Let's take a few minutes, the three of us, and say, all right, we're in charge now. Greg, Billy, Tom, you guys are in charge of fighting the war in Afghanistan. Uh, don't, don't we have to train these guys? Isn't there a risk when you train them? Do we not train them? Do we go away? What do we do? I mean, the first thing we do is we listen to our war fighters, men on the ground, who have been in Afghanistan since late 2001. 
who have and and by the way, those men who have become seasoned war fighters over those years, and know just like the culture that uh, Greg talked about, it that his son told him about. Aaron told us. Aaron told Karen and I the same thing. Raunchy things that they saw that our American men from Western civilization saw put before their eyes constantly that that the Afghans allow and are basically forced to accept it. Uh, Aaron talked about. Men raping kids where they couldn't step in and do anything to protect the kids because it's against their culture. Uh, back, listen to the warfighters. Let the warfighters do what they're trying to do. Leave the Afghans. If we have to give them money to rebuild their country, give them money to rebuild their country. It's cheaper than American lives and American treasures that we've, that we've spent. Come home and know who the enemy is. Kick their butts and come home. And in fact, Tom, the records show. From 2001 till 2009, we lost about six, uh, between five and 600, about 600, 650 men in Afghanistan. When the Hearts and, Nines, uh, Hearts and Minds uh, strategy was implemented by Barack Obama, Huh? Oh, I, it went no, up. It no, went went way up. up yeah. Hundreds of percent. Yeah, I mean thousands. And and then wounded in action went from about sixteen hundred to about sixteen thousand under the Obama administration. And and if that's not bad enough, and this is right from military records that Karen and I have access to, if it's not bad enough that we begin to meet, lose more American warriors, the number of deaths among the Afghan civilians, as the Americans backed off and began the hearts and minds strategy, the number of death among Afghan civilians actually skyrocketed because the Taliban and Al-Qaeda began, began to kill more Afghan civilians as the Americans were back out of the way. And the, and, the, and the thing is, the sad thing is, the criminal thing is, is the American government knows this. If I know this, if I have these numbers, they know it. So what's the agenda? What is their real agenda with our, with our warriors? Uh, well, Greg, what, uh, how would you go about uh, doing things differently if, if it was you know, 2005 all over again and 2003, 4, 5, we're, we're getting out of Iraq and go, oh, there's problems over in Afghanistan. From what you know now, what would you suggest the, the United States government does? I think the government has to let the soldiers do the fighting and make the judgment calls. I don't think a president who wasn't even in the Cub Scouts should be making decisions like this. You know, the rules of engagement, the way they're set up, you know, I just think it's outrageous. But our, you know, how many generals had to, you know, leave, you know, their, their post, you know, they had to move on. They taken their stripes away. You know, any time they go against the government or make their own moves, they get in trouble for it. You know, it's just you got to do everything that the government tells you to do to appease them. I don't think we should appease them at all. I think let us fight a war and let us do what we know how to do and let our military do what they're trained to do instead of preaching and telling them to uh, be gospel singers, you know. <laughs> they want us to turn around and do everything they want us to do, and it doesn't work that way. You know, we go there, we have to do what we have to do, and if some civilians do get injured and murdered, then so be it. But let us fight. You know, we were trained to fight and let us go and take care of this. And this all would have been over with years ago if they would just let these soldiers do what they're trained to do instead of them sitting back with their hands tied behind their back. But our government looks at them as it's a chess game. And uh, my son and Aaron and all these other young men and women who die are pawns as far as I'm concerned, to the government. And if they lose a few pawns, who cares? Who cares Let's right? just move on as long as the king and queen are safe and sound. I think it's BS. Good and point. things need to change. And if not, and if they don't want to change them, you know what, give me these young men and women back home and we'll protect the United States with our Air Force in the skies and Navy in the waters and bring our soldiers here and build our borders and protect our, the United States of America and stop worrying about Afghan and the Middle Eastern countries because I could really care less about any one of them. That's I, it. I have an idea, Tom. What's that? How about put a bullet in the head of pedophiles, serial pedophiles, so they don't uh, turn kids into uh, sex slaves and it's end up turning up killing them good Marines? How about we not? How about we hold up for American values and American civilization, yeah, and the heck idea. with this uh, <laughs> demonic culture? This is a demonic culture. Just put bullets in their head, Jesus. Uh. But not changing. You're not changing their culture. 
You know, no, it's right. been like that. No, all right, put a bolt in their head then. I'm happy well, with that. One of the mistakes that George Bush made, and, and it's understandable because it had just happened a couple of days <coughs> after 9 11. Uh, he said, hey, we're not at war with Islam. Islam is a religion of peace. That was um, a misunderstanding, a miscalculation, and the bad guys took advantage of that. Uh, improper understanding of Islam and exploited it tremendously when we should have said this system is like Nazism, is like Shintoism we fought in World War II against the Japanese, it's like Marxism, Communism, it's another totalitarian, basically demonic system and we have to fight it that way, we're not going to change them, we're not going to change their hearts and minds, these, this is an enemy that only understands brute force. We have to go in and destroy the place. And if they want us to rebuild it, we rebuild it according to our rules, both in Iraq and Afghanistan. The constitutions that the United States put into effect had at its fount, at its, at its foundation, Sharia law. How do you build a, a, a Western, uh, Western-influenced culture on the Sharia law, which is incompatible with our society? So it was an incoherent process, and the argument was, well, if we don't do something, it's going to be bin Laden's uh, nest for terrorism, and they're going to reach out and strike us. Well, we've talked to our friends, General Paul Valley and many others, who have military strategies to deal with that sort of uh, environment if that occurs. But, but the big problem, as I see it, is this guy. He went to the beginning of his... Uh, presidency in 2009, uh, January 20th, he was inaugurated. And then in June, just a few months later, oh wait, he won the Nobel Peace Prize, didn't he? Somewhere like in February, I think. February, when, February he gets nominated. One month after he becomes president, he gets nominated for the Peace Prize. He gets it in October. He had to do something to earn it, because it was like given behind the scenes. So he figures some sort of peace in the Middle East and in, in Asia. And uh, as a result, he goes on his uh, apology tour <coughs> all over the Middle East, goes to Cairo, Egypt, at the uh, uh, University of Cairo, apologizes to Islam. You know, Bush made one mistake, and uh, Obama doubles down on that mistake and apologizes for what we have done to Islam and how great Islam is in America. And that set the president precedent in 2009 for an incoherent and uh, illogical military strategy that still had good warfighters in it. But the strategy was in conflict with the warfighters like your son, Billy, and they can't fight and kill people the way they're trained to do. They have to become peace brokers and diplomats. And your son, yeah, politicians, and your son, Greg, was sacrificed on the altar of political correctness. Uh, absurdity. Let, let me, can what I say happened? something very quick? Yeah. yeah, we lost Greg for a second. Oh, so okay. um, we'll get him back. Yeah, Greg's coming from an uh, undisclosed location on very high-tech equipment, an iPhone, I think. <laughs> but it's working, working pretty good. Yeah, yes, Billy, good. what's up? Uh, well, well, and, and I don't know if Greg can hear me right now or not, but uh, to, for me, this is a special show. This is the first time that I've ever got to participate, that I've ever gotten to participate with a Gold Star dad. Really? And oh, it, cool. is. It, it is. It cool. is. And, and uh, the, the, the thing about that is, is I know it's not easy for him to sit there and talk about his son, yeah. uh, but it is something that we as Gold Star dads have to do. And what I'd like to say is any Gold Star families that have a Gold Star dad that are listening or watching Tom's show, uh, I'd like for you to contact the United West because uh, as, Gold Star, as Gold Star families, we have skin in the game. We have skin in the game, folks, and we, have, we, we need to be involved in changing the policies in this republic that, uh, that affect our warfighters. We've lost our sons, and many of you have lost your sons and, da and daughters. But we need to speak up and defend those sons and daughters who still run to defend, these, to defend this flag and defend this republic. So uh, uh, it's just a challenge to Gold Star families out there. Uh, let's step up to the plate and be on the platform that our sons and daughters left for us and, and, and uh, save this republic. Hey, hey Greg, uh, you're back now. No, no, um, no, no, he just dropped off he? again. Yep. Dropped off again. No.
Oh, he was back. Get, when you he get him back, back, let me know, because I, I, I want to pick up Billy's challenge and uh, see if we can put together a coalition of Gold Star dads who are fed up. Not, you know, look, uh, there's a grieving process, and we really didn't get into your story because we got Greg with us in a, in a unique time right now, but uh, all, all the dads go through, and the moms, and the whole families go through the grieving process. But at some point, as you, you can see it in Greg Sr., he went through the grieving process, then he got angry, and then he wanted justice for his son and justice for other war fighters who are being chewed up by the Obama incoherent, illogical, uh, politically correct system. So maybe you guys got to get a bunch of people together, and we'll help to get a Gold Star Dads, Gold Star Fathers Coalition, not to just all, you know, console each other, but to consolidate that fighting capability, fight this battle legally, properly, professionally here in the United States of America. And that battle will take us into Washington, D.C., for sure, to straighten out some of the problems there. You want to be involved in it? You want to run it? <laughs> we got to get it done. Is Greg with us? No. All right, well, we lost him. His cell phone ran out of battery. But um, what do you envision that looking like, Billy? I mean, how many guys you need to get something going to have a, a strong voice? We can start with five. I, I mean, any, any, listen, dads. Women don't take this wrong. This is men's work. It's, it's not fun. It's not fun to talk about the losses of our sons and our daughters. It's gut-wrenching. The enemy out there is serious. The enemy in the White House hates the republic that our sons and our daughters have given their lives for. So, I, you know, I, I haven't thought a lot about this. But you can contact Tom at the United West. We can begin to put our heads together. We can begin. I, I can tell you this. We can force Washington, D.C. to listen to Gold Star parents. If we're united, if we know our facts, if we know the policies that we want changed, we don't need to come storming and screaming outrageous claims like Obama's a Muslim or he's not an American, or this and that. This is not a left or right issue. This is an American issue where men and women go off to serve this republic because they love what they leave behind more than they hate what is in front of them. And we need to make, we as parents need to make sure that the generation coming up will still do this. Because it's been said by somebody a lot more famous than me, the nation who forgets its warriors is soon forgotten. And we can't let that happen to this republic after our sons and daughters have given so much. So let's unite, folks, for a common cause of saving this republic. Uh, and let me underscore that, Billy, um, the importance of you dads coming together, gold star dads. And, and in one sense, you're 100% right. Uh, the moms don't need to be on the front lines confronting the bad guys and confronting the senators and all of that. Uh, they, can be, they can be right behind they can you. Be. Yes, absolutely. But this has to be led by very tough people who are willing to fight. And look, these, these people who killed your sons tried to kill Mark and Damon and me a week ago in Texas. They came here to kill people. And uh, so the, they're bringing the fight here. So the importance of you guys getting together to have a voice that goes to Washington primarily, to the Pentagon and to the Capitol, and corrects the problems with this administration, so vitally, vitally important to protect all Americans right now. So we will do whatever we can, the, the United West, to help with that. We'll do more shows like this. Our special thanks to Greg Buckley Sr., who took time out of a busy schedule today to be on the show. I'm sure we'll have him back. And Billy, can you get some other gold uh, star fathers to come absolutely, on? Absolutely, right. absolutely. At least uh, a couple more had hoped to make it today, but the time time didn't work out. All right. Well, we'll we'll do maybe one one a show with you because these stories are so immense and well, so important. Well, I, I do have to say this though. 
uh, Billy, um, I'm more afraid of Karen than I am of you. <laughs> let so. me, uh, you know, I think <laughs> I agree with that. Well, let me, let, me say, let me say this. There's a, there is a reason why I said that about our Gold Star Moms. Because Western civilization, the greatest treasure in Western civilization is our women and our children. And men, if we don't step up and step out in front, we're, we, we are risking losing our greatest treasure. That's why I made the challenge to the men. Amen. Not because the women are not capable. <laughs> not because I know they are. <laughs> and on that note, we have to end right now. Thank you, everybody. Friday, May 15th. Have a wonderful, safe, jihad-free weekend. See you Monday. Yes, yes indeed.